This is the Language of Business, a show to inform and inspire entrepreneurs and anyone thinking about a startup. Hear about strategies that work and strategies that often don't work from people who've been there and done that. Our host is Gregory Stoller, Harvard MBA and senior lecturer at Boston University Questrom School of Business. Here's Greg Stoller. How do you tweak an international business without killing it? We're on location virtually with Yoshi Takeda, who is the president of Mickey House in the United States. A few months ago, we visited them in their Mount Vernon location, which is just outside of New York City. And Mr. Takeda, welcome back to the Language of Business. Hi, um, everything's great. I mean, of course, you know, this coronavirus, you know, issue is really affecting our business. However, our online business is booming. So our entire, you know, sales in the United States actually more than last year, last couple of months. So you told us a few months prior that uh, you came into the United States with a fairly high priced platform. Now uh, in the middle of COVID-19, is that still the case? It is a still, still it, it is the case, but of course, you know, uh, we lower the price, some of the standard items, so that it's got to be always, you know, everyday good price. I wouldn't say low price, but <laughs> because it's a you know fair value in you know, prices. So that's what we are doing right now. And for the seasonal items, obviously, our stores are closed for you know a couple of months, so we had to get rid of it. So you know we um, you know reduce the prices for this for the customer service purposes, and you know from the inventory point of view. You originally told us that your best-selling product were baby shoes at $79. Is that still the case? It is still the case. However, you know, under this situation, you know, uh, people cannot go outside. And so we are promoting comfortable, durable, like an in-house wear. We say lounge wear. So, you know, our very simple T-shirts and, you know, easy, comfortable pants are selling very well in terms of the last couple of months. In most of your brick and mortar concessions or stores, you said that the three key words were durability, sustainability, and quality. Now, mm-hmm. being in the middle of COVID, do you think that message is still resonating with your customers? It is, but uh, I would add comfortable. You know, this is most important because they, stay, have, they have to stay inside of the house all day long. So it is very important for them to be comfortable. But is the allure of having three generations of products, so a product that could last for three generations, still working while everybody is inside their homes? Yes, it is. I mean, especially, you know, uh, they have to pass down and they have to buy. Well, you know, I talked with, uh, you know, a top executive of Bloomingdale's department store. They say that, you know, uh, men's clothing is, you know, sales is huge. However, children's clothing is still stable. It's maybe 15, 20%, you know, down. The reason why is because whatever happens, heavy rain, you know, coronavirus, kids are growing out. So they have to buy the new items. And do you think that Mickey House's products are able to be viewed well enough online that parents don't have to worry about fittings or the touch and feel of your clothing, etc.? Well, that's a, that's a challenge, of, of course. But once they trust us and use it, they will understand that. So the first step is a very you know, difficult part. But we always try to explain you know, uh, by the words. And sometimes you know, we also have a you know, phone conversation and email conversation, how it fits and those things. And also we got to have like a small interview with the actual user to show you know, you know, how she or he used our products. When we visited you in Mount Vernon, as I mentioned, just outside of New York City, you had an almost completely computerized warehouse. Have those operations at all been affected because of COVID? It is. And um, we are so lucky to have that, you know, uh, automated system. Otherwise, we cannot survive. You know, our sales is really online so four or five times, you know, more than last year. So if we don't have that system, I don't know, you know, maybe you have to pack every, you know, everybody has to pack, you know. So, and, and how about things in Japan? Are, is your Japanese market reacting in a similar way in terms of a transition to online commerce and not having operations be affected, or is it different? So our business is heavily depending on department stores. And, you know, people are not coming into the department stores, you know, after it happens. And, you know, there's a, like a one month and a half, you know, clo- closure period for most of the department stores. So, you know, it is very difficult for us and we have to, we are forced to switch from, you know, offline to online. 
And in addition to that, the travelers, you know, like um, Center Tokyo, Center Osaka, we had a uh, lots of international travelers. This is dead. This is nobody's coming to Japan. I mean, nobody's traveling. Right, of course. So, you know, um, that affects a lot our business. However, again, even in Japan, our online sales is five times more than last year. So it covers Amazing. somehow. Yes. Mm-hmm. And how about your other locations? I know you've been active in Russia, you've been active in China. Are any of those locations reacting similarly or differently? China and Russia is different. China, it's, you know, you know even though it's, uh, you know, center, you know, it's, it's coming from there, but, you know, they control very well. So we are actually opening up new stores in Shanghai, like last couple of weeks, and we're going to open up another store in Mongo. And we're going to open up another store. So we are actually expanding the business in, you know, these East Asian countries. And, um, you know, people are shopping. You know, high-end business is booming. You know, not only Nikki House, but the other brand as well. So, but you know, are you and your team able to travel over there to supervise? Or are you continuing to do uh, everything so via email or FaceTime or line, etc.? We chat. Right. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I asked you this a couple of months ago, and I'd be interested to see if your answer would change now. What is your biggest worry about the future of the business? Actually, I'm seeing more hope than worry. You know, this is a wonderful opportunity to change ourselves and uh, to, you know, to remodel our business, you know. So it is, I'm, I'm not so pessimistic, pessimistic about the situation. Um, I would rather think that this is a wonderful opportunity to change ourselves. So, you know, honestly, I mean, I'm not so much worried about it. I mean, only the thing is like, of course, second wave, third wave, you know, this is, but I already calculated and it could happen. So, you know, only the worry maybe is that supply chain probably, you know, um, if it affects Japan or China where we are produce our merchandise, the supply chain can be, you know, stop. That's only things. I see more demand in the market in the US. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not worried about the demand side. However, supply side, you know, that's my probably big concern. Yeah. If COVID stopped tomorrow and everybody started returning to your stores and to your concessions, do you still think that online commerce is a better distribution channel? It is. Absolutely it is. And it's corona, I mean, from my point of view, you know, um, I thought that this online shift is going to be going to be happening or completed i would say because it's already started from three four years ago so online shift i have been already you know pushing towards online and so now um because of the coronavirus you know everything happening like in a couple of months instead of a couple of years so you know this is a direction in any case but uh, my my point is how we can human touch you know business you know through online so maybe you know, chat room, we have to probably open up a chat room or we have to have like, um, you know, face-to-face, maybe Zoom, you know, setting. Um, we have to have more, you know, you know interactive, you know, um, communication with the customers. President Takeda, thank you very much. Thank you. Yoshi Takeda, the president of Mickey House America. business international just because or because of one's international heritage? We're going to find out why right now. We're on location at the Boston University Questrom School of Business with Rodolfo Pena and welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks for having me, Greg. You are Brazilian. Yep. And you're running two startups. Tell us about them. Uh, So the first one uh, is an idea that I got since I came here like two years ago. Uh, Before I entered the MBA as a food business, I like 
I would like to bring some Brazilian recipes to US. Every single American that I knew at the moment like loved Brazilian food. So and I was very close to a, a big industry in Brazil and they want to expand to US. So we started a project, bring the food truck, serving those recipes and that like end very well. So now we, we run like pop-up restaurants and a food truck and we are expanding like this year for the best locations in Boston. And the second one? Uh, the second one I started here at Questrom on the Summer Accelerator. So it's called Hire5. Uh, it's a marketplace connecting uh, Brazilian and Latin American developers, software developers to U.S. startups. If you had gone to school in Canada as opposed to in the United States, do you think these would be Canadian startups? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I think so because I was coming here, I was able like to see the market and like understand the market needs. So probably I would look for opportunities in Canadian market. So we're just looking for like how can I how can I met the customer needs? And as you are uh, in the place, like in the US in this case, I could like see uh, how to do that. What is the difference between the average customer in Brazil versus the United States? The average customer. Uh, first of all, income, like it's a high income uh, country here compared to Brazil. So people have more disposable income to, to spend. So they're looking for new, uh, new things in, in case of food, like new uh, business to go and spend and try new foods. And talking about like startups, uh, they have more opportunities. They have like, they, they can fund more, uh, they can, can raise more capital so they can expand their business uh, fa uh, uh, quickly compared to Brazilian business. It must be easier raising money in the United States, but is the loyalty of your investors the same if you are working with a Brazilian investor versus a U.S. investor? Uh, I, I never raise money here, but like looking for the entrepreneurs that I know, like it's definitely easier to raise money here because uh, the offer of money, like the, the, the possibilities that you have here in the U.S. Are, are, are much higher than in Brazil. Uh, but I would say as you have more investors available, uh, you tend to be, uh, your investors, I don't know, tend to, to be like m less into your business and like, and create that relationship with you. Like for the food truck, we start like getting investment from that company in Brazil. And uh, we kind of, we are now kind of friends and like be partners in business uh, for this venture. And we see a long relationship with that like in the future. How do you have time to work on both startups? Uh, it's hard. Like I think the uh, the best way to do that is getting the uh, the right team, and like making sure that you have in place processes, and and you give like ownership on the on the business for your team. Like you identify talent, and make sure that you can make your best employees and and partners like also uh, owners of the business, so they they always work like for the the best interests. And do you spend an equal amount of time on both? Uh, no. So during the summer, I launched Hire5, and I spent all the summer there uh, working on Hire5. And now I'm like finishing my MBA second year, uh, and I kind of dedicate my time for like the business that needs more of my time that, at that moment. What would you consider to be an outstanding exit strategy for either one? Uh, sell to a, a, a franchise uh, a chain. Uh, a new a new concept like like Chipotle. Chipotle sure, yeah, is a Mexican yeah, concept yeah. that was amazing in IPO and like it's growing a lot. So uh, as we get traction and open locations and brick and mortars, uh, I, I definitely see that strategy. Uh, for Hire Five, uh, I started the business thinking about like generating a cash flow business, not like selling and and getting raising uh, venture capital. As a startup, like we're always looking for a different strategy and like pivoting to a one idea to another, so it can turns turns out like to be totally different than I expect right now. Rodolfo, obrigado por todo. De nada, obrigado por obrigado você por me convidar a estar aqui. Thank you very Thanks much for having me. Rodolfo Pena talking about running two different startups while being a full-time second-year MBA student at the Boston University Questrom School of Business.
I didn't even realize what it meant to be in a top tier business school until my first day. And I just really, for the first time, felt like I was in a place where everybody knew what was going on and everyone was incredibly driven uh, to study this and perfect this field. And so I think being in a top business school really means that you are finding the barriers and the edges of the field and pushing them a little farther. And that's what Questrom has taught me over the past four years. The curriculum at Questrom is really helpful because you get to not only study the basics of business such as accounting or marketing, but you really get to dive further in and to see applications of the health sector and how business applies to sustainability efforts around the world. They really want us to kind of focus it on four emerging areas, and those areas were healthcare, security, sustainability, and technology. Those are really where the jobs are going to be. They really want us to come out from the Questrom School of Business and, like I said, be able to work in any area of the industry. How do you go about recruiting students for university not knowing what the future is going to bring? We're on location virtually with Liz Wagoner, who is the Director of Online MBA Admissions, and Dana McFawn, the Director of MBA Admissions at Boston University Questrom School of Business. We originally sat down in February and were trying to figure out how the school was going to organize itself for admissions, and that was, of course, pre-COVID. Now the world has literally turned upside down. Uh, Dana, we'll start with you. What's happening on the graduate and MBA admissions side? Yeah, it's been a whirlwind of the last few over the last few months. Um, we have actually seen uh, an influx of applications since everything has happened. Um, I think uh, everything happening has really uh, forced people to reevaluate their next steps and what they're looking to do um, with uh, graduate management education. And so, yeah, it's it's been dealing with a lot of unknowns, but it's definitely brought a lot of great candidates. To the, to the table and we're really excited for the people who've been, who've been applying. Questrom has a terrific full-time and evening MBA that's called PEMBA. How are the applications shaking out? Are they even from a full-time and PEMBA side or are you seeing uh, the line skewed one way or another? Yeah, we weren't really sure at first what we would see, um, but actually we've seen um, an uptick in both uh, for applications. So um, we actually saw um, more applications in our final round for full-time and for our, our part-time or professional evening MBA than, than we anticipated. So, um, you know, we were wondering, will it be more full-time or more part-time? But as of right now, we're seeing an increase in both. And what's happening on the international side for the full-time MBA? Uh, yeah, I, we got actually a lot of great applications for both domestic and international candidates. I think, um, you know, we have something called the learn from anywhere modality where students have the opportunity to um, do the fall semester from wherever they might be. Um, so that has lessened the burden for international students to have to figure out how to move here for fall, uh, which means they could apply later and still potentially start the program this fall. So, so we actually saw an increase of applications on both sides. So this is pretty cool. You're saying that a student who formerly had to physically be in Boston to get his, her, or their graduate degree can now do this from really anywhere in the world. Yeah, you know, we're committed to delivering an on-campus experience, uh, especially for those who are able to and feel safe being here and being on campus. But for those who don't, for whatever reason, whether it be visa restrictions or just health concerns, um, they'll have the opportunity to remote in and do the program. So our students will be able to participate in the program from wherever they are and not in a separate different program, but the same residential program just from wherever they might be. Liz, we will turn to you. Uh, your world uh, not only has been turned upside down because of COVID, but if memory serves correctly, this is going to be the first time we are running uh, an online MBA program uh, at Boston University Questrom School of Business. What has it been like to start with that program from an admissions perspective from inception? It's been really neat to, to be a part of this from the beginning. Our first class kicks off, I'm not sure when this will air, but August 1, we sort of start our Mod Zero for this very first class, and they're an outstanding bunch. Um, we've had to pivot a little bit, doing a lot of Zoom meetings as we finalize everything and finish the planning of launching this program, and um, we actually increased our class size because the quality and number of students was so great. We didn't want to turn away great applicants. So um, it's been really exciting. And I'm, I think I'm the most excited to see sort of them all start next week um, and connect with them as real official BU students and, and to be our first inaugural class. 
how do you find applicants? I know that with traditional full-time or evening MBA programs, if you put up a website, they will come. Has that been the case with the online MBA in terms of getting eyeballs to visit a site or have your phone ring? It's been really interesting. So actually the other day we have been doing our planning for these virtual events and we hadn't done any advertising for it. We just put it on our website and without even sending out a notification, we had over 200 registrants and then we sent it out to our inquiry database and had over 600 registrants. So there is really great interest in the program. I think people are um, both looking for an alternative opportunity right now just because they're seeing remote learning versus online learning. And I, I've had a few students say, I never thought I would do this, but in a COVID world, now I'm thinking maybe an online education will work for me. So Dana, let's go back to you for a second. Someone is interested in getting a graduate degree. There are a number of one year specialized master's programs at the Boston University Questrom School of Business. There's online, there's full-time, there's evening MBA. How do you counsel someone to make any sort of simplicity of that maze of possibilities? Yeah, there are many options. The good news is that, um, you know, uh, there's an option for everyone. And it, what really uh, matters is that people are taking time to think through what the best fit is for them and we're here to help. So when candidates reach out and want to connect and learn more, you know, we're able to sort of counsel them and help them figure out what program is right for them. So, you know, are they looking to make a career switch? Are they looking to move up within their current industry? Are they looking to get specialized education or more broader education? Are they looking to be in the Boston area on a residential campus and in a residential experience or are they looking to do it remotely so you know it's just it's it's counseling it's talking to candidates sure. and, and about all the different options that we have it's why we do so many virtual events so that students are able to go through and um you know really learn about each of the programs and figure out what the right one is is for them you know liz and i are actually doing a virtual event quite soon um where that's exactly what we're doing is helping to helping people to understand what the different programs are so they can figure out what the best fit is for them. They're, they're all great programs. It's just a matter of finding the one that makes sense for each candidate and what their particular goals are. In preparing for the segment, I noticed that Questrom has recently increased the size of its online MBA program. How is that possible? Is there a cap? How should a prospective applicant think through that, please? So we did increase our class size. Um, so we are going to be bringing in a class of 400 for this fall 2020 and a class of 400 for January 2021. So we are already recruiting for that next next cycle. Um, and so what I would say to the student is we uh, we do have caps I and mean, we do have rounds of applications, but we're never looking for reasons to deny you. It's not like undergrad. We, you know, we are looking for reasons to admit you. In the online MBA, we have a little bit more wiggle room because um, you know, we can, it's not like literal seats in the classroom where you run out of seats. Um, that's not to say we don't have caps, like I said, we do. Um, but what we'll do, so for example, for January, if we have so many great applicants that we can't offer everyone we want to a seat for January, we'll just look at them for the next start date. So um, for August, 2021. So we would say, hey, we really like you, you're a great fit, we're out of seats in this particular class, but we'd like to offer you a seat in a future class. So if you're admissible, we wanna see you in the Questrom Online MBA. What does your crystal ball say about the future of online education? I would say that I think that students are, or particularly students that are in school right now, are starting to realize that there is a difference between remote learning and online learning. And I think that's a big distinction. And so, um, you know, I think that online learning is becoming more and more acceptable, more and more programs are adding on online options, which are different than just, you know, what happened to us in March where we had to take our on-campus programs and throw them online. Um, you know, we've been really thoughtful in building out the online MBA from the ground up and really thoughtful in how the curriculum is still delivered and developed and making sure it's with the online learner in mind. And I think more, it's true, more and more students are going to look for that as an opportunity. But I also think there's a really strong value in an on-campus education as well. And so it really just depends on everybody is different. Dana talks a little bit about fit and assessing fit. And I think that there is room for everyone at the table. And it, what for me is most important that students know of all their options and then get in front of someone like Dana or myself and get counseled on which might be the best, which might be the best fit for them. And that's really what's important. Do you think COVID has had a positive or negative impact on applications for the online program? I have to admit it has been positive. Um, I don't, I feel weird saying that. 
Um, but, you know, I think there has been some, some students that have lost tuition remission or tr tuition reimbursement programs, and that certainly is, is a negative. But in general, I think it has showed students that there is value in online learning, and so it has opened their eyes to a program that they might not have previously looked at. Dana, do you worry that online is going to cannibalize uh, full-time or evening MBA seats? I, I think that that certainly was an initial concern. Um, you know, again, wondering what's going to happen when we when we expand our portfolio of offerings. But I think Liz said it really well, which is that there's you know a seat at the table for everyone. I think each of the programs offers um, something a little bit different for for different people and how they learn differently and, and what it is they're looking to get out of the experience. So, you know, they're really, you know, each of the different programs really is meant for people looking for different things and, and all of those people still exist in the world. So I, 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 I actually think that, you know, we're finding that we're just actually able to provide um, a broader range of offerings so that we're offering the right fit to everyone um, as opposed to cannibalizing from existing programs. So, so no, I, I think there are still people who very much want the residential experience or want the other sort of benefits that come with the residential programs. Um, and, and then there are people who want the online experience. And, and so I actually think that there's, you know, like I said, Liz said it, Liz, Liz said it best, there's, there's room for all of them. And this segment is going to be on international business and it's heartening to know that people all over the world are still attracted to different programs, either residentially, evening wise or online uh, too. Yeah, absolutely. Liz Wagoner, Director of the Online MBA for Boston University Questrom School of Business. Dana McFawn, Director of MBA Admissions, also for Questrom. Thank you both for appearing today on The Language of Business. I think the students that do very well have two passions that they're working on. The first, of course, is they need to manage people. They like to manage people. They like running projects, running products, they like dealing with organizational challenges. And the second thing I find is that they're very curious and interested in how technology can make changes both to the company they're serving or to the customers or uh, to uh, even uh, suppliers and, um, and vendors. The students have to be change agents because no matter what you do with technology, you are changing the way people work. So technology is often used as the instrument for creating organizational change. Organizational change is difficult to create, and uh, the construction of a digital artifact is often the way that an organization affects that change. Yeah. Um, and so our students are very, very well positioned to be sitting in an organization doing that because they understand the organizational structure and the management structure and the business structure with their MBA degree and they understand the technology piece in order yeah. to produce the artifact that's going to do that. Support for the language of business is from Boston University Questrom School of Business. We're also available as a podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for watching.